Are you a first time coach or have a brand new team of players this season and you're thinking to yourself, how in the world am I gonna create a good team culture? Well, we're gonna teach you how. Download our free resource guide to help you get started this season. Link is in the description below. Here are our top five best ways to get to know the new players and build team culture on your team. All right, so let's hop right into question number one. How can I quickly learn the strengths and the weaknesses of the players on my team? I think some of the really good ways is taking a name tag, putting it on their chest so when the kids are in their circle and you're seeing them for the first time, you can always address them by name. And you as a coach, you also have a name tag on so they can address you by name. That way, you're starting to build some trust. Another way is to make sure you have either a 10, 15 minute one-on-one -on -one meeting with every player. You know, with the player, with the parents, what are their goals, what are they looking to get out of the season, and you can also talk about what your goals are and what you are expecting to get out of the season. So I think those are a couple of good things. Awesome. I mean, I'm a big fan of asking questions, right? Get to know the kids outside of just, you know, yeah. baseball and softball. I love the idea with the name tags. What do players most look forward to? right? Getting to know them outside of the X's and O's, but what are they, what are they like the most? What makes them afraid? What are they, they nervous about in game? You know, what makes them tick? All these players are going to learn, learn different ways. Different things are going to make them tick. Different things are going to get them excited. So, you know, great, great points right there. Coach Steve, what are some effective ways to build trust in your players? Yeah, I think that's, that's a big one. I would say early on, just open communication. Right? You want to talk about your goals as a coach. You want to talk about your expectations for the season. I say this all the time, but you know, if you're a coach that's going to have a couple, couple rules or a couple guidelines for the season, make sure you stick to them. All right? We don't want to say something on day one, and then three weeks into the season, the best player on the team jogs down the first baseline and you let it slide. Right? So it's, it's holding each player accountable, you know, regardless if they're the best player on the team or maybe they're, they're at the bottom. But open communication, just being honest, being honest with the parents, with the players, and like I said, the, the goals and expectations for the season are big. I think it's also important to have an open door policy, right? If a, if a player has a question or you know, a mom has a question to be able to like, hey, our, our door's always open. If you wanna contact me, go ahead. Here's my email, here's my phone number. Like, let the kids talk. And I think another way to build trust is even when they're warming up, walking around, hey, Johnny, how's it going? What'd you do this weekend? How is everything? How's everything? going how's school going you know I think that that helps build trust as well when you when you go out of your way to kind of get to know each player without a doubt I think asking them what other sports do you play right understanding who they are outside of the game and we talk about it all the time here at zoned uh, you know sometimes the best times during a lesson are when you're cleaning up the balls you're in the back of the cage you're talking to them about school you're talking to them about homework you know are you gonna have a snow day on Friday all those little things that you know lets the kid in a little bit and 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 to know you who you are as a person outside of just coach Duke or coach Steve and I think the moms and the dads it's so funny when you know that little Johnny loves the Yankees and there's a certain trade that went on or Aaron Judge just signed a contract and you're like buddy you see the Aaron Judge contract and all of a sudden he's like, yeah, did you? It's almost like that one thing that you can always go back to that you always have something that you can talk about. Yep. So I think knowing that is, you know, is a huge thing. Question three, how do we address different skill levels within the team? I think that's a, that's a very challenging one, whether we're running a class and we don't know who the kids and skill levels are, or you have a team. Yeah, the kids are, might be the same age, but skill levels are all over the chart. So, you know, grouping the players up by skill level first, that way, maybe the kids that have certain challenges, maybe they don't throw as well, we put them together so that we can work specifically with them for that 10 minutes in practice. Yes, ultimately it's a team game, so they all have to play together, you know, when the game starts, but certain times throughout practice, we can group them together so that we can work specifically on individual goals. Yeah, that's huge, and we, we say it all the time, but if you've got a kid that's a stud shortstop, and he's throwing 65 miles an hour across the infield to a first baseman that's afraid to catch, well, then they can't play in the game. So it's our job in practice to make sure that, like Duke said, we, we break them up by ability level. It's not that the kids are working on different things. They might be doing the same exact you know, skill set or drill, just maybe with some smush balls or some wiffle balls or tennis balls to build that confidence. And I, I, I think you'll see the, the increase in, in ability much mm -hmm. faster. The confidence is going to be there, and they'll actually be able to go out and perform and do the routine, playing catch during a game, um, you know, catchers being able to catch the ball, first baseman having the confidence to, to catch a rocket from the shortstop. You'll see that progression much quicker if you start out the right way at practice and don't just kind of throw them into the fire. And I just heard you saying yesterday to one of your kids about talking about homework 
and bringing some of those drills that you're working on back home with them so that they can work on it, especially if, you know, they're deficient or their level of play isn't as good as maybe some of the other guys, Mm -hmm. you know, giving them homework and things that they can actually practice on at home can also help them enhance their level and get them up to speed. And that's every player. The yes. best player on the team is going to have homework. The worst player on the team is going to have homework. So our job as coaches is to kind of recap practice at the end with, all right, guys, we all know what we need to work on today. All right, if you don't come find me, let's talk about it. But some, you know, somebody's got to work on something different at home during the week. It could be with, it could be with a smush ball off the wall. It could be taking some swings off the tee. But we never want to start practice exactly where we left off with last week's practice. Practicing for 90 minutes a week is going to help. But if you really want to see development, it's got to be the, the, the time at home when nobody's watching. That's really where we're going to see the growth. Coach Steve, what team building exercises can you do outside of baseball? There's so many cool things, but some people are just like, what, what, what do we do? How can, I, how can I bring them together? What are some things outside of the baseball field that we can do? Yeah, I mean, two that come to mind, and they're on kind of total opposite ends of the spectrum. I think one, you know, we get invited to, to do the Easton High School first pitch dinner every year right, where we get to go and talk to the team and get them pumped up. You know, so doing some sort of a dinner or, you know, a barbecue or picnic early on in the season just to get to know the players, talk about your team's outlook for the season, what are we most looking forward to. You know, and then the second one, which we've done for years, is uh, a team building night where the kids come in and it's not baseball or softball at all. Um, It's different obstacle courses. It's, uh, you know, brain teasers. We've done like, you know, marshmallow pyramids. We've done the magic carpet ride. We've done a a blindfold obstacle course just to get the kids kind of out of their comfort zone, get them talking, um, get them communicating. That was some of the most fun we've had, you know, in, in March before the first practice even started. But you get the kids in here and put them through a whole variety of different tests and you start to see oh this kid might be a leader on the team this kid's a little bit shy but it opens them up outside of the baseball diamond just to to communicate with one another to have fun to learn each other's names really just a you know a good kickoff to the start of the season you know and you can do a family wiffle ball game you can go out bowling you can go to a professional baseball game and talk about you know the different situations that are going on you know some of those you know cost money but having a, a wiffle ball game outside in a barbecue with the team, you know, it doesn't cost anything. Our last one, and, and probably the most important, and it gets overlooked a lot, is how do we communicate effectively with the players on our team? I think you have to first think to yourself, what age am I coaching? If I'm coaching eight-year-olds, well, then I have to get on a baseball knee. I have to get down to their level and think like I'm an eight-year-old. We can't be sarcastic. We can't use hard words. We have to keep it simple. We have to explain ourselves. We have to explain ourselves again and again and again, you know, when it comes to doing that. Because remember, this could be the first time they're ever playing the game. So they don't even know what some basic things even mean. They're not going to know. So really breaking it down, also knowing, you know, how they learn. You know, you want to talk a little bit about auditorial versus visual. Like, are they visual learners? So, you know, how they are that way I think is very important as well. Yeah, I think every kid's going to learn differently. And we talk about it in our coaches' clinics every year. Some can, can learn by seeing it, right, where you actually demonstrate the correct move. Some can just hear it and they're fine, right? You say, you say it, and it and it just sticks. And then other kids need to feel it, where you might actually have to get down on the ground and show them what a fielding triangle is. You might have to you know, position their hands where you want their hands to be at launch. So everybody's going to learn a little bit differently. So I think we as a coach need to understand, all right, I've said it three or four times and it's going in one ear and out the other. And then I think the, the last piece is go in small steps. I was guilty of this when I first started coaching. And, it, you know, I've heard uh, our buddy Kevin Wilson call it power coaching. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you want to teach. And I, w- I was a young coach that, you know, I just come out of playing pro ball. I wanted to help the kids get better. And I felt like sometimes I was throwing so much information at at them at once that it would just cloud their memory, right? We've got 9,000 thoughts going on in our head. So I think starting off with the basics and going step by step and and saying, all right, you know what, we're going to master this one move this week. Next week we'll be able to move on, but we can't kind of master 10 different moves and then go back next week and say, where where do we leave off, right? I think uh, keeping it simple, keeping it basic, you know, focusing on one thing at a time, you'll, you'll see the progressions much, much quicker and then they're gonna know what they have to do at home. Check out this next video on your screen to learn how to overcome some of the top obstacles new coaches have.